Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Recently, I took a look at the cheapest DDR5 memory I could find, Crucial's 8 gigabyte DDR5 4800 modules, and they weren't that bad. In fact, in terms of value, they were actually quite good, and as a result, I felt for anyone building a new PC right now, or at any point in the future, it's finally time to move on from DDR4. Now, that's not to say that DDR5 delivers the most bang for your buck, or those already using a DDR4 system should upgrade. Somehow this was the takeaway for some that previously watched that content, but I assure you that wasn't what I meant when I said it's time to leave DDR4. Rather, if you're going to build a brand new PC right now that requires a new motherboard and memory, I feel you're best off going with a DDR5 board and then some cheap entry-level 8GB DDR5 modules, which you can upgrade in the future once DDR5 becomes the mainstream option. I came to this conclusion when testing the Core i5-12600K, which you typically pair with a Z690 motherboard, so quite an expensive board to begin with, and therefore $84 US for some DDR5 means the memory is by far the cheapest platform cost. But what about those planning to buy what we believe to be the best value budget gaming CPU right now, the Core i3-12100, which costs just $130 US or $110 if you opt for the FSKU. So to find out, I'm again testing the DDR5 4800 8GB modules, along with some DDR5 6400 memory for reference, as well as a range of DDR4 configurations covering the 2400, 3200 and 4000 speeds. Now, one of the very best value B660 motherboards is the MSI Pro B660M-A, which retails for $130 US if you want the DDR4 version, or $160 US if you want the DDR5 version. So a rather large 23% premium there for the DDR5. As noted earlier, a 16 gigabyte kit of DDR5 4800 memory costs $84, while 16 gigabytes of DDR4 2400 starts at just $45. Then the premium DDR4 3200CL14 that we use costs $100, and the popular DDR4 4000 CL19 kits, they cost around $100 as well. So if you can generally get comparable performance to that of premium DDR4 out of the cheap DDR5 4800, it'd make sense even for budget processors such as the Core i3 12100. Now for the testing disclaimer, again, I'll say that the testing conditions are geared towards forcing CPU bound scenarios by using a GeForce RTX 3090 Ti at 1080p, often with dialed down quality settings in an effort to maximize frame rates. Now, depending on the games you play, this sort of testing can be unrealistic, but the idea here is to highlight the differences that the memory performance can make when CPU limited. And the sorts of games where I'd say this testing isn't that realistic would predominantly be non-competitive games, so single player titles, titles that don't require hundreds of frames per second, games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Cyberpunk 2077, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Spider-Man Remastered, for example. In those examples, the priority really is on visual quality, so almost always you're going to end up being GPU limited, not CPU limited. Now, games where you will often find yourself CPU limited include titles such as Rainbow Six, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Fortnite, and basically any other competitive shooter that you can think of. Anyway, keep that in mind as we go over the results, as I will be using some of the single player titles previously mentioned for showing the performance differences between the various memory kits. Also, just to recap, as I mentioned, the graphics card for all of this testing will be the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti, and of course the CPU is the Core i3-12100, as I'm interested to see how the most affordable DDR5 memory works with an affordable CPU. Then for comparison, we have G-Skills Trident Z5 RGB 32GB DDR5 6400 CL32, 39, 39, 102 kit. G-Skills Trident Z RGB DDR4 3200 CL14, 14, 14, 34 kit, which will be tested with two and four sticks for a single rank and dual rank configuration. And then we also have Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro. DDR4 4000CL19 232345. So with that, let's get into the results. Starting with the Watch Dogs Legion results, we see the 12100 is good for 89 FPS on average using DDR5 4800 memory, which places it roughly on par with DDR4 4000. However, it seems as though DRAM latency is important here, as the CL14 3200 stuff was faster than both the 4000 and DDR5 4800 memory. Then, when installing an additional two modules for dual rank operation, the DDR4-3200 configuration was clearly faster, roughly matching the performance of the DDR5-6400 memory. 
Now, generally speaking, DDR4 3600CL16 and DDR4 3800CL18 are comparable to that of our DDR4 3200CL14 memory, particularly the dual rank configuration when it comes to gaming performance. And that means in this example, DDR5 4800 is comparable in terms of performance to popular DDR4 memory. And the point being that the performance differences aren't that significant, which is why I feel it is time to finally start moving to DDR5 for new system builds. The DDR5 4800 memory doesn't fare quite as well in Rainbow Six Extraction, but again, we're not talking about a significant performance difference here, especially given we're using an RTX 3090 Ti at 1080p. For a similar price, DDR4 memory can offer around 7% more performance, so not exactly an earth-shattering difference there, and I think most of you will cope perfectly fine with over 200 FPS at all times. Hitman 3 really benefits from the use of DDR5 memory, with the base model 8GB 4800 kit beating all tested DDR4 modules, even our dual rank low latency DDR4 3200 memory. When compared to DDR4 4000, the DDR5 4800 kit was 6% faster on average. Certainly not a large margin, but for similar money you might as well opt for DDR5 now, at least based on these results. Next we have Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which is a good representation of typical gaming performance. That is to say, you'll almost always be bound by your graphics card. In that case, everything above DDR4 2400 is fine with the Core i3 12100. Of course though, this might not be the case with more powerful CPUs, graphics cards, and of course future games. But today, many games, especially single player titles, will be GPU bound, and this is what those results will look like, all much the same. Moving on to F122, we find that despite the test conditions, which should see the CPU become the performance limiting component, with the exception of the DDR4 2400 configuration, the game was largely GPU bound. Sure, frame rates were a bit higher with the DDR5 6400 memory, actually 1% lows were around 12% better, but we're only looking at single digit gains from DDR4 to DDR5 6400. The 8GB 4800 sticks were a little weaker here, but given you're basically getting DDR4 performance, you might as well make the switch for a new build, as it ensures a superior upgrade path. Now, as noted in my previous video covering these 8GB DDR5 modules, most gamers using something like an RTX 3090 Ti will game at 4K when playing a single player game like Spider-Man Remastered, and here the game is almost entirely GPU bound, even when using DDR5 6400. Still, using this game as an example of CPU bound performance, we see that DDR5 4800 is able to match DDR4 4000, as well as our low latency DDR4 3200 memory. And that's a positive result, despite the fact that the 6400 stuff was almost 30% faster when looking at the 1% lows. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is another CPU demanding title, though the Core i3 12100 is more than powerful enough and will easily enable over 100 FPS, should your graphics card be capable of such frame rates. Again, we find that DDR5 4800 is comparable to DDR4 3200 low latency, up to DDR4 4000. It's really not until you go as low as 2400 that you'll see a noticeable performance decline. So again, although DDR5 4800 is a good bit slower than 6400, it's not worth paying a premium for high speed DDR5 just yet. But for those of you building a new PC from the ground up right now, these 8GB modules are a pretty good stopgap. Horizon Zero Dawn, like Hitman 3, shows that even the budget DDR5 memory provides a performance advantage over DDR4. It's not a big one, but even still value for money, what we're seeing here from the 8GB 4800 memory is impressive, beating all tested DDR4 configurations. It's a similar story in Cyberpunk 2077 as well. Here the DDR5 4800 memory was a whisker faster than all tested DDR4 kits, though overall performance was much the same. But the point is, given these results, I'd be very tempted as a new PC builder to ignore DDR4 and opt for the newer DDR5 memory. As seen previously, ACC is one of those games where memory latency really matters, though again, if we cranked up the quality settings or used a lesser GPU, you'd certainly see these margins narrow. In any case, DDR5 4800 memory wasn't that impressive here, as DDR4 3200 single rank was 13% faster. Now, if these results were the norm, then it would be hard to say if you should take the plunge with these budget 8GB DDR5 sticks and hold out, say, 6 or 12 months before DDR5 pricing improves for the more premium stuff. The DDR5 memory performs quite well in the Rift Breaker, 
Here we're running the canned CPU benchmark with ray tracing disabled. In short, DDR5-4800 is comparable to low latency DDR4-3200, as well as DDR4-4000, while DDR5-6400 offers around 15% more performance under these test conditions. Last up, we have Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and performance here isn't influenced all that heavily by memory performance. The DDR4-3200 dual rank configuration along with DDR5-6400 provided the best results, but we're talking about a mere 9% margin between DDR4-2400 and DDR5-6400, so memory performance really doesn't matter here. It's really all about single core performance, and for that, DDR4-2400 generally provides enough bandwidth. Finally, here's a look at the 12 game average, which has been calculated using the GeoMean, and as you can see, the 8GB DDR5-4800 modules are comparable to that of DDR4, whether that be DDR4-4000 or low latency CL14-14-1434 dual rank 3200 memory. As a side note, it's quite interesting that from 2400 to 3200, we're looking at a 33% frequency increase, while the higher clocked memory operated at much higher timings, and overall, that netted us 12% more performance. Then, from 4800 to 6400, that's another 33% frequency increase, and that's a 10% boost to frame rates. So, quite comparable, and it stands to reason that in the future with more demanding games, DDR5 will look even more impressive. So, should that be the case, investing now without blowing the budget on premium DDR5 might not be a bad idea. So, now that we've seen all of the data, does it make sense to go with DDR5 now, even for budget builds? Well, if the aim is to save every last dollar, then quite simply no. But if you're looking at purchasing a decent motherboard and have a reasonable budget for your memory, then I think, yeah, it is worth it. As noted earlier, the DDR5 version of the MSI Pro B660M-A costs $30 more, but you stand to save around half that on the 4800 memory, opposed to DDR4-4000 or quality DDR4-3200 cell 14. So in that example, once you factor in the price of the CPU or motherboard, the DDR5 option ends up costing no more than 5% extra. And the advantage of course being that if DDR5 pricing does settle down and higher quality lower latency kits arrive, you can upgrade your memory which could potentially unlock additional performance in future games or allow you to better utilize next generation hardware. Either way though, it's really not a big risk given the performance and pricing today, it's really much the same. Again, none of this is to say that you should upgrade to DDR5 if you already have a perfectly capable PC using DDR4, and ideally, if you can wait, that's probably going to be the best option with next-gen hardware on the horizon from both AMD and Intel. But all of that aside, it's great to see DDR5 pricing nudge closer to that of DDR4, and it appears to be happening quite rapidly with massive price drops over the past four months or so. Anyway, if I were building a new Elder Lake PC today, I almost certainly would grab myself a DDR5 board, throw two of these cheap 8GB 4800 sticks on it, and get gaming. And that is going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do, subscribe for more content. We also have Patreon and Floatplane for those of you who'd like to become a Harbor Box community member, get access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, Q&As, and behind the scenes content. But if not, as always, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.